listening to Iron Source Level Up with guest host Mishka Katkov. Hello and welcome to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing and of course playing mobile games. It is hosted by the fabulous Mishka Katkov. Hi Mishka. Hey, thank you. <laughs> fabulous. Now I need to say also fabulous, Tom Kinibara. Hi Tom. Hey there, how's it going? Tom is a mobile consultant for Mobile Free to Play, the community on mobile game design. Firstly, about our host, Mishka. Mishka is the head of the studio at Rovio, having previously worked with some of the biggest franchises in gaming, including Supercell, Zynga, and Fun Plus. And he is the founder of the popular site, The Constructor of Fun, which breaks down successful free-to-play games in search of what makes them fun or makes them not fun. So today, Mishka, I'll put the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you for a fabulous introduction. And I'll carry it on with fabulous Tom over here. So Tom, you know, we've known each other a little bit before, but tell us about yourself and, and especially how did you got into gaming? And I know you've been making games since what, 3GS? Yeah, pretty long time ago. I think I've been now in mobile games since the App Store. I should get a cake to and celebrate it but uh, yeah no long time I was kind of lucky I didn't do anything to do with games at university uh, I was like a neuroscientist so I was like, really into science and then I couldn't get a job or didn't do a PhD and decided oh okay let's look at other alternatives and I got this little course on media and this course did four weeks a week in TV a week in radio a week on games and a week on web and in that I met a guy called Johnny Coughlin who worked at a company called Chilingo back in the day and he was the head of publishing there and and he gave this little presentation on mobile games. And I was like, oh my God, I play mobile games. I've got a 3G. And I actually knew some of his games. And then after that, I, I basically pitched him. I was like, hey, you look like a cool guy. How about you need a, an assistant or something? And he was like, sure. So with absolutely no experience and never having done it before, I kind of pitched my way into working with Johnny and helped him out as his assistant. And Chilingo, as you know, maybe was one of the leading publishers of the first wave of mobile. They worked with Rovio. They worked with Septolab on Rovio on Angry Birds and Cut the Rope and a whole host of other games. So I think in the time that I was there, I think I was there four years, we published close to 300 games. It was like a release rate of around about two or three a week. And most of that was like 99 cents. So we were very good at making super casual, simple mobile games. And that's where I sort of cut my teeth on, you know, working with developers, working on game design and working on mobile game design super fun. I enjoyed every minute of it, but then I kind of lacked the passion for publishing as much. I wanted to get actually into game design. So I went and joined Wooga, big casual studio in Germany. I started working as a game designer there, mainly on the simulation game and, and a few other titles. And in that process, had a really fun experience, like learning like the art of game design. And I met Adam Telfer, who went on to form Mobile Free to Play. So Mobile Free to Play is what we do now. And it's really Adam and myself and a few other consultants. And we write a blog sort of describing what's going on on gaming trends but we also like help now a lot of different studios around the world some big some small both in how to build a good free-to-play studio and also how to monetize and how to retain using free-to-play mechanics so really we progressed from what was 99 cents into free to play. And I was kind of part of that learning and understanding. That's awesome. I mean, of course, uh, an avid reader of mobile free to play and always happy to have your posts as well on, on Deconstructor Fun. So tell me more about the focus on hyper casual. I mean, it, it is one of the newest subcategories out there. So when did you move that focus? Hyper casual is kind of interesting as it's, yeah, like you say, very, very recent. I'd say in the last two years, possibly three years is kind of how it's come around. And as a sort of phrase, what it stands for is gameplay that's almost instant. That's how I like to think of it. Within 10 seconds, you will be playing a game. And that's one of the uniquenesses around it is that you're straight into gameplay. And usually that gameplay is self-explanatory. There's no tutorials. You go in, you attempt to do a small challenge. And at the end of that challenge, you will be rewarded, usually with some currency. So it follows a lot of like free-to-play mechanics. But the real difference between, say, casual or hyper-casual is just the speed at which you get in there. There's some other differences, which I think we'll discuss, but um, I think that really happened. And, and if you had to look back in history, Ketchup were really the very first main proponent of this. And they came from sort of nowhere. No one had really heard of them. And they really just shot to the top of the free charts. And unlike other mediums like 4X games or Match 3, where you're looking at the grossing charts and you can see apps slowly grow up the grossing charts and then they kind of stick when they have good mechanics. A hyper casual is all played out in the free charts and apps tend to shoot up and be number one for a short period of time and then drop out again. 
So what other big differences do you see between hyper casual and casual games other than in hyper casual games, you instantly get into the game, instantly rewarded. The lifetime of those games is shorter, so they're not growing organically and then through paid acquisition. What you're saying in hyper casual, you just shoot up like a star into the top three, hold your position for a while and then come down and a new game takes over. So am I correct with going those and what other differences there are between casual and hyper casual? On a game design perspective, both casual and hyper casual share a lot of similarities. So all trying to teach you to do a very simple thing at quite a large number of times. So rather than it being a development of, say, stats or skills in a sort of a character development, as you might expect, or a level-based game where you have a saga, in this, it's normally a score. So high score is kind of the focus and that really the games work around the speed at which you can input. So the dexterity of your fingers, the challenge of moving your finger across the screen or a, a timing challenge. And the reason that we call that sort of hyper-casual over casual is the gameplay sessions are actually shorter. So they reach a peak of challenge much quicker than a casual game. Whereas in a casual game, you might be expected to have a very simple experience, but it's usually spent over a longer period of time. We're talking casual games maybe last two to four minutes and a hyper casual game maybe last 30 seconds to 90 seconds for one gameplay experience. And that's from a gameplay perspective, the easiest way of categorizing which is which. But there's a few other nuances that basically hyper casual fits into. Got it. So definitely more skill based. Yeah, initially. So what we're seeing is it's actually progressing. So what's nice is that hyper casual as a genre is growing and expanding in their mechanics. So you're now seeing kind of combinations of two or more mechanics. So originally, every game had a single main focus mechanic, and that would be the core of the gameplay. So take, for instance, Helix Jump, where all your trying to do is jump through certain roles and, and that is the game you're a ball and you're jumping you might also have like line rider which is where you're in a motorbike and you're just riding a line everything is about that one mechanic the objective is probably either to get as far as you can to get as high as you can to stay alive as long as you can and it's really about that length of time whereas casual basically what the difference is there is usually you have more of an objective like maybe it's collecting stars and then all of those stars add together to unlock a new focus and so that the longer term gameplay has more meaning and the hyper casual tends to just sit in this bracket of like one high score one run one chance Type thing. So Tom, when we look at the market and how it has been changing throughout the years, it's clear that it's gone more towards deeper meta game, towards longer lifetime values. So why did hyper casual happen? Why did these sort of super simple arcade games, why did they come back? Like, why is it such a big deal now? Well, so this is kind of where one of the big differences is actually not in the gameplay. So hyper casual is actually more about a business model. So unlike casual games back in the day, the objective of a casual game was to keep people playing and to probably put a pain point in the flow of the game. So let's take a match three game, some very simple match three. You run out of moves, you lose the level, and you would pay premium currency to skip that. And so the objective of casual is to monetize people through some premium currency. Hyper casual removed almost all premium currency and turned towards video ads. So video ads became essentially a way of monetizing a free player without them actually paying any money. And on the relationship between the video networks and the game developer is where the monetization is happening. So the focus really for Hypercasual has been to optimize the number of video views that you have and to optimize the number of video networks you can support to basically get the highest ad yield from that game. And so the business model itself is very, very different. You're not really as interested in building this long-term relationship with a player where they feel the need to spend money. You're basically having a much more short-term relationship where you want them to very quickly die and watch an ad to continue. And that is the more arcade game style. So think of it as like a coin slot. Instead of a coin, we're watching a video. So basically, to summarize it, the rise of the CPIs and the improvements of mediation and all the video ads has created a business opportunity for much more simpler games. Basically, the arcade games that we used to play 20 years ago, maybe the games that we played on browser even before that. So that opened up the model and then the whole subcategory. Yeah, I think so. And like, it was interesting that people didn't really see how valuable video ads could be. So 
if you think back, say, two years ago, video ads were seen as a way of driving for X Games. You would see something like Game of War spending upward of $20, $30 to get an install because they were making so much money in their game through monetization, premium currency. Um, that really what you had to see is some developers were like, well, if we can just show a lot of ads, will we make more money than if we try to sell them the premium currency? But then what became clear with Hypercasual is the games that worked best were the games that could drive the lowest CPI. So you basically had to create a game that within an icon, within an image, within a name was immediately obvious what it was going to be. Like ping pong would be the name of the game and the icon would be a ping pong bat and then the gameplay would be just playing ping pong. Nothing more, you're not asking anything more. You just have the ads as kind of a feature. And so when you have something as simple as that, it actually works super well as an ad on say Facebook or Instagram or even on a video network that within 30 seconds, I can see something, watch a video and totally understand what I'm supposed to do. And so that actually drives installs. So if I'm a player and I see a video ad and I actually understand that game, I have nothing more to learn, I'll click that ad and play that game because that's what I wanted to do. And so actually the business model went further of not just making money through the video ad advertising, but also being very, very cheap to advertise themselves simply because of the simplicity of the concept of the game. Got it. The CPIs for other games and the low CPIs for advertising these hyper casual games. Exactly. Exactly. And so so because as hyper casual, you know, we're all talking about it now in a sort of singular game sense, what became more apparent is the speed of development is another important fact here. A casual game might take three to six months to develop. And that that's kind of cutting it short. That's not really adding a lot of quality and everything like that. But a hyper casual game, if you have the tools, you can build them in two weeks. They're very, very simple. There's a lot of software now that you can use to just really speed it up. And in doing so, you can test ideas quickly. And those ideas being tested, you can test them live in the advertising. So actually see what the CPI is after two weeks. You don't have to build for three to six months. And also, once you've got people playing your game, you can see how many ads you can show. So what's like the average number of ads per DAU or what's the click-through rate of your ads and, and really how is it monetizing? And so those two things added together means that within two to four weeks, you can have from pitch concept to a game on the store that's generating you revenue. And this sped up development time hugely. You know, that's not how most free-to-play works. Okay, so I have a question and that is more like, how has hyper casual changed the mobile landscape. I mean, they came out of essentially nothing, you know, Ketchup didn't have any predecessors and massive amounts of downloads at the highest. Voodoo was generating about 70 million downloads a month. Ketchup probably around 50 to 60. And now both of them have declined a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about the change in the mobile landscape that hyper casual games created and, and how sustainable that is? I think what's interesting about mobile is just how open it is as a marketplace. We're all on the app store. There's two app stores. So there's Google Play there's Apple, everyone is equal. Every app is made equal. Every app has a shot. Every app is on the same chart. So that's actually like an absolutely perfect marketplace if you had to think of it in terms of economics. And so what Hyper Casual did is it exploited really cheap, low installs with a very different business model. So you were making money from somewhere that no one had used before. That's the video ads. And so very quickly at the beginning when there wasn't a lot of competition, they were making large amounts of revenue. They were getting maybe an install for five cents a person and they were maybe making 20 cents per DAU. So if they could keep that person in for one, two, three, four, five days, they're making quite a lot of profit. What's actually happened is that they're basically playing an arbitrage game between how cheap you can get an install and how much money you can make from that install on the ads. And what's happening is because of the competitive landscape. So we now have Plagendary, we have Voodoo, we have Ketchup, we have Quali, we have all of these publishers that are releasing not one, not two, but maybe eight games a month each. On the marketing front, they're all competing for a similar user base. And it's very important important to know that like we talk about hyper casual as kind of this game design method but fundamentally it's a business model so it's how are these companies all fitting in around each other within that business and if you know anything about businesses like a kind of phrase of like blue ocean red ocean so there's a lot of competitors there they're all eating the same people and they're all competing and that generally raises the prices for everyone and so it feels to me that you know after two years of very lucrative boom in this space there's such a high competition and there's such a willingness from the consumer for new mechanics that the cost of releasing so many apps and marketing so many apps is eating into their profit centers. So fundamentally, you're not making, I don't know, the arbitrage used to maybe be 50%. So if you put in a dollar, you can maybe make $2 back. Now we're probably talking like 5%. So you're putting in a dollar, you're making a $1.05 back. It's just getting eaten away by those competitive marketing practices. Yeah, that, that's kind of clear to see as well because we've seen the decline in the installs. But let's talk about best practices for ad revenue for a hyper casual game. Like what are the best 
ad units to use. Again, think about what's the most lucrative in mobile, it's rewarded video ads. So the difference with that is the full video is watched for 30 seconds. You cannot skip it, you cannot quit it. And basically at the end of it, you would get the reward. Now, it used to be that those rewards are premium currency, but because we're not talking about premium currency anymore in hypercasual, we're really talking about lives. So you actually just get one more go through watching a video. And so when you're thinking about monetizing a hypercasual game, what you're really looking at is what's the number of rounds that I can generate from a player before I can easily show them an ad so that they'll want to play more rounds. I always think in sort of game terms as a round being, what repeatable unit am I doing where at the end of it, I either won or lost. So if any of the kind of mechanics we're talking about, and if you, you know, in the article, the top 10 game mechanics, what they all do well and why they work from a monetization perspective is that the rounds are very short and the way you win or lose is very clear. So getting to the top of something, getting the highest score, not getting hit, for instance, uh, you know, you have one life. Um, these sort of objectives from a player perspective are really easy to understand. But also from a monetization perspective, they're really easy to monetize because you can say, oh, just have one more life. Oh, just have one more go. These type of things work really well for swapping a video view for that particular monetization element. Got it. So when we're focusing on monetization, there's KPIs a developer needs to follow. And in more of a casual games, we're of course looking for those KPIs that affect the long-term retention because in any LTV model, that's really the key of great revenues. So what are the KPIs developers should be looking in hyper-casual games where the uh, the long-term retention doesn't seem to be that important? I think everyone would love to have great long-term retention, but that's the hardest thing to get. I often like kind of describe to the people we work with retention as being like miles per gallon in a car. So everyone would like every car to have the largest miles per gallon, but every car can be built in a different way to do a different thing. So having an SUV is one type of car, having a sports car is another type of car, and they're actually designed for different purposes. So we have to accept that through the mechanics and through the simplicity of those mechanics in hypercasual, that we're never going to get as long-term retention as, say, a match three game, as, say, you know, four X game. They just aren't built that way. Once you've played the game ten times, you kind of fully understand it. So, what you really want to see is so that the core KPIs that we're looking for would be the highest day one, because that means it's so interesting and exciting for me that I want to play it tomorrow too. And that if we can get people to come back even one day, we've done a really good job of making it stick. The next most important metric is really the number of views you can generate on your ad units per DAU. So I always advise that if you're looking into making some sort of game, it's not necessarily all about retention in hypercasual. It's whether the mechanic itself just fits nicely with lots of video views. And there's quite a few games that actually do this very well. I think idle mechanics have a lot of different ways of increasing the views. So uh, Future Play like kind of mastered this a long time ago with their games Farm Away and, and Build Away. And what they looked at is how can we get video views that are opt-in, so someone chooses to do it, that do multiple things in the game. So they're not just about one life. They might be about doubling your income for the next four hours. They might be doubling your income that you earned while you were asleep, or they might be to have a bonanza for a short period of time. And that there is four new ad units that is bigger and better than just that one retry unit. That's really interesting. All right, let's say I have a hyper casual game. We build it, we spend a good two weeks on it. It feels <laughs> really fun. You're putting in the time there as a developer. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really putting in time with, with one developer and one artist. So we've now fully invested. And, and you know what? We actually published already in Holland and it's, it's performing really well. We're looking at day one and it looks like 65. What next? Should we publish it ourselves? Get our friend, the UA manager? Or should we call to one of these publishers like Ketchup or Huge or Quali? Everybody seems to be doing a hyper casual game these days. Yeah, I think that is, it really depends on your situation as a studio and who you are. So if you're fresh, like you've not really done a lot of game development, I always think working with a publisher early on is going to teach you so much. So having been on the publishing side, you know, we were helping new studios that had been done their first game. And just like you say, they might have knocked out of the park straight away with a 65% day one retention. Just because you've built something that does that does not mean you will be a success. You still have a lot of work to do to monetize it. You have a lot of work to do to market it. And I think accepting where your weaknesses are is what a publisher is all about. Now, let's say if you're another scenario, let's say you're a three-year studio, maybe you've, it's just the two of you, but you've worked together for three years and you've maybe released 10 games. They've all been reasonable, but nothing's out there. It's really the question of, do you want to invest the time and effort not in game design, but in learning how to market it? 
Are you going to sit there and create campaigns, make creative, understand messaging, understand targeting audiences, understanding data, how to send the data back and forth and how to optimize your campaigns towards the, those data points? This is not a simple task. This is why we have marketing departments and game design departments. They're not the same. So I personally, but this is because maybe I've been doing this for a while, like doing it all myself. So I could take a game, take a high performing game and then work out the marketing for that game myself. But I still take advice. You know, I would always seek to ask experts, opinions. And, and that's partly because the people I know and like how I've been working together that I would feel that I could do that myself. But if you're not in that situation, I think that's where you have to seek out that advice. And let's be honest about what a publishing deal really is. A publishing deal is you're swapping your potential revenue that you can get today for the idea that shared revenue is going to be worth more money in the future. So if I could have $100 today, that's 100% mine. What you need to say is, can a publisher make me $220 tomorrow and take 50% of the, the revenue? Because if it's in that regard, it's going to be more profitable for you to work with a publisher. So just try to think financially and think about your personal situation, what you know and your experience, because that's when you want to start thinking about publishing. So how do you go about finding the right publisher? Good question. I think every publisher is different, but every publisher kind of has a unique thing that they're probably better at than others. So often it's a mechanics. So some publishers are really good at match three. Some publishers are really good at war games. Some publishers are really good at hyper casual. You're looking basically for a publisher that's done something as similar as your game in the past as to what you're doing right now. Because at least then they'll have an audience potential. They'll have known what's worked. They'll know how to market your game effectively. And then the other thing to really look at is scale. If you do have a, this success, it's not just about about the small amount of marketing it's can they get that marketing to scale to the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of installs in a day that takes a team that takes knowledge that takes infrastructure so when comparing you want to ask those sort of questions like okay how would you scale my game what would you do what's the things that you're going to offer me i think a really interesting thing having been on both sides of the sort of negotiations let's say is most of the time developers don't ask the right questions they just accept that marketing will happen you can dig in you can tell me what is your marketing plan how did you do it in the past if a publisher is not willing to tell you, then that's a big red flag for me. The more open and honest a publisher is on what they do and how they do it and how they're going to do it for your game, that's what makes a good publisher, not a bad publisher. Mm. So what, what would be the tips of sort of a strategy based on ad monetization? Game specific. So there's definitely some easy 80% wins, yeah? So the first one is like in hyper casual, especially the mechanic is everything. So when you're doing your marketing, you're really showing off that mechanic. So you want to take really short 10, 15 second videos of your mechanic uh, that really show how fun it can be. So not just a simple boring video, but the very best bit of that mechanic. If that doesn't basically communicate what it is that you're trying to sell, then you basically not capture the right video. And the other side of it is think about the audience you're talking to. So I think with hyper casual, especially the audience is basically younger. They're usually into an arcade style approach and they're usually people of the kind of social media media platforms, the millennial type thing. So talk in their language. You always have to talk in a kind of an emotional response way, like try to cause a challenge for a player, try to answer a kind of exciting element. And this is something that you would test. So the most amazing thing about Facebook and Google and everything else is you can essentially come up with 20 tests in an hour or two. And then it's simply a matter of reading the metrics. What got the most click? What got you the cheapest installs? Put your money behind that. Perfect. So you mentioned about publishing versus self-publishing. You know, when we talk a lot about about hyper casual, the publishers are definitely the thing that have been on the rise. And at the same time, we're seeing that the ROI is not there. It's not what it used to be because just of the more competition. So in your opinion, do you think it's a bubble or do you think it's a subcategory of kind of like the new form arcade games that is here to stay? I think it definitely is showing signs of bubble. So that basically is where there's too much hype and everyone believes that everything's going to be here as it is today. So then really we're talking about the guys who are playing in the space now, the publishers of right now. And I think all of them know that the space is heating up and that they are finding it harder and harder to find that hit game. And it's up to them to innovate. I think this is where it comes down to like someone taking some interesting take on the gameplay. Someone maybe pulling in some mechanics from casual. There's no need, for instance, to necessarily stick purely in hyper casual. What if we expanded the mechanics to make them monetize for longer? What if the audience is looking for more now? All of those things are possible, but it's uh, hard to say. You know, you need to do these tests. So is it a fair assessment to say that the hyper casual games are perhaps getting a little bit more casual nowadays and we're just seeing more casual games with ad based monetization? 
I think so. I did another piece on mobile free-to-play, which kind of talks about the LTV versus CPI graph. And fundamentally, what you're always looking at in sort of mobile is because marketing forms such a big part of free-to-play, it doesn't really matter how much your marketing costs. It really matters about the relationship of how much money you can drive per user to how much that user costs. And so really, there's a very long straight line where if you're spending $50 to get someone into your game, but you can make $55 from that person however they play, then you should market. You're on the positive side of the LTV CPI spectrum. What Hypercasual has really been doing is it's basically getting very cheap marketing, so 5, 10, 15 cents, and it's making 20, 25, 30 cents. If you can't get those CPIs and if you can't get those LTVs, then the game's dead. And so what we're seeing really is it's much, much harder to get the same CPI and LTVs. And that to me basically is showing you that that's not somewhere to be playing. If you were deciding on building a game now, why don't you look at the top end? Why don't you try and make a $10 game and can you get your CPI down to $5 or $4 even? And that's where you're actually going to make more profit. But that is the business of mobile gaming. That is the business of free-to-play, guys. So it's actually kind of easy when you look at it on that, but it's very, very hard to build a product that does those things. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what to build and how to build it. It's very easy to just talk about how to make money, but very hard to actually make it yourself. Yeah, that's that. Amen, uh, honestly. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. This was phenomenal. A fabulous, if I may say. And it was a fabulous interview and a well introduced. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Tom. It was really great having you both here on the podcast, learning a lot about hypercasual and publishing. Um, so thank you very much. We hope to have you back on our podcast soon. Mm-hmm.